show. It is Sunday, August 15th, 2021. And we are live. Calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. So uh, on today's show, uh, we're going to uh, – we talked about this earlier in the week because, uh, you know, I'm on six days a week. We talked about this uh, on Thursday. The census 2020 data is out and it's causing panic for some people uh, for the first time since 1790. For the first time since 1790, the uh, white population has dropped. It dropped by seven. It dropped by five point one million in the uh, overall census numbers. And this is continuing the browning of America. This is continuing the browning of America. The first census was taken in uh, 1790. And we know the census was created uh, by the U.S. Constitution. The census is taken every 10 years. And for the first time in history, the white population, the number, the overall number of the white population has dropped. It dropped, dropped by 5.1 million from the 2010 numbers down to 191.7 million and there is the fear of the browning of america the fear of the black browning of america and the fear of a black planet so we're going to talk some about this and also what does this mean as far as redrawing congress congressional districts because the drawing of congressional districts is based upon the census numbers and that also influences how many seats in the U.S. House of Representatives states have. And that also impacts how many electoral college votes a state has, which then plays into the presidential election because the electoral college votes are associated with becoming president elect. Well, what determines how many uh, seats in the House of Representatives, what determines how many electoral college votes a state has. That's based upon the census. So when Donald Trump wanted to have a, a, a an immigration question or a citizenship uh, question on the 2020 census, I, I, I automatically knew and many people knew what that was all about. That's about driving down the uh, numbers counted in democratic leaning cities and states to then reduce how many seats in the House of Representatives they have and also reduce how many electoral college votes those democratic leaning states have, which reduces their power in choosing the next president in the presidential elections. So we'll discuss that. Then also there was an article, a big article from uh, August 8th from Deneen L. Brown in the Washington Post. And this article dealt with how lynchings in Mississippi never stop. Now, we've talked about lynchings numerous times here on this show. We talked about how uh, from 1882 to 1968, uh, there were 4,743 lynchings in this country. And we know Mississippi had the most number of lynchings at 581. But there is a, um, a, a report from Jill Colin Jefferson, Jill Colin Jefferson, who created an organization called Julian, named after the late uh, civil rights activist Julian Bond. And Jill Colin Jefferson has been uh, tracking these lynchings. And um, she is saying that in Mississippi, there are eight suspected lynchings there have been eight suspected lynchings of african americans in mississippi since uh the year 2000 since the year 2000 okay so we'll discuss that as well uh, tiffany cross on the cross connection on msnbc spoke with uh deneen l brown about this piece uh that she wrote for the washington post and we talked about this story earlier in the week also so we'll discuss that as well um, and then there, there's a um, many people have heard about the terrible earthquake that has hit Haiti. Uh, it hit uh, overnight and 
it, it was a uh, now it's more than 1,200 people are reported dead. More than 1,200 people are reported dead from uh, this earthquake. And there are aftershocks as well. And at the same time, Haiti is bracing for a tropical storm that's going to hit also. OK, now this is after uh, Haiti's uh, President Jovenel Moise was assassinated back uh, in July, July 7th. So this is just one thing after another for Haiti. So there's been an outpouring of support from celebrities. There's been a, a, a number of different articles written about this. We've been posting about it also uh, on our Facebook fan on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network. Uh, the search for survivors uh, continues. The 7.2 earthquake was a devastating blow to a country still reeling from a presidential assassination. A tropical depression is expected to batter the island uh, starting Monday, Monday, uh, August 16th. I'm looking at the updates here from the New York Times. OK, so we'll talk some about um, uh, Haiti as well uh, in the, in the earthquake in Haiti. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the 38th annual African world festival is returning to the Charles H. Wright museum of African American history. And it's going to be on Friday, August 20th through, uh, Sunday, August 22nd. And African history network will be there once again. Detroit walks walks the runway returns to the African World Festival. Detroit walks the runway. And uh, we'll speak uh, to, uh, on today's show with the uh, coordinator of Detroit walks the runway, uh, Miss Piper Carter, to give us an update on what's going to take place this year and what we have uh, to look forward to at Detroit walks the runway. This is a fantastic uh, fashion show that features um, Detroit talent. Detroit rocks, Detroit rocks the runway, I should say. Detroit rocks the runway um, where fashion gets cultured is a Metro Detroit community uh, fashion showcase that takes place inside the African World Festival, highlighting an exciting mix of African inspired contemporary and traditional garments and live music by emerging designers and musicians of the uh, African diaspora. So we'll speak with uh, Piper Carter, uh, coordinator of Detroit Rocks the Runway um, at the bottom of the hour. All right, and then also um, the Olympics have ended. I'm gonna go back on Peacock NBC's app and watch uh, some of the Olympics. I have some of it recorded also. I'm going through trying to clean out my DVR. Um, but Shikari Richardson is set to race all three of the Olympic 100 meter uh, medalists after the Team USA suspension. Uh, this is a race uh, coming up, uh, I think it's next week. So we'll talk some about that as well. Uh, I saw some articles. Hello, beautiful has an article dealing with this as well as uh, uh, Fox News and some other outlets uh, are reporting on this also. So this is going to be a showdown. She's going to be racing. Uh, the, it's at the Prefontaine Classic in Eugene, Oregon. She's going to be racing against uh, all three 100 meter Olympic medalists. Uh, Team Jamaica's Elaine Thompson Hara, Shelly Ann Frazier, Shelly Ann Frazier Price, and Sharika Jackson. Okay, so that is going to be something to see. All right, uh, that's come that's coming up very soon. We'll give you some more information on that as well. So we know that uh, Shakari Richardson was disqualified was disqualified because she failed the uh, drug test. And everybody's been rooting for her uh, also. All right, so we'll discuss that as well. 
Okay, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. So we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and sign up for our email newsletter there as well. Uh, you can still register for the uh, 10-week online course that I teach on Saturdays. 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968 from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. This is a 10 week online course that I teach and we deal with history from uh, the end, the last year, of the Civil War, uh, 1865 through 1968. So we go through uh, Reconstruction. 1865 to 1877. Uh, we go through the uh, Jim Crow era, World War One, World War II, uh, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement to see what happened in our history, what happened to uh, uh, African Americans, what laws and policies were put in place, and how do we get to where we are today? Okay, so we can better understand where we need to go from. Uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power. It's a 10-week online course. You do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. You can uh, go back and watch it over and over again. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com uh, to register for the class. As soon as you register, you can watch the class that took place yesterday. And we'll post the link here also. That's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. Uh, we're coming up here on the break in uh, just a minute i want to go to this first story here this deals with the uh census okay so we know there were some issues with the uh uh census it was harder for the census to be conducted in 2020 because of coronavirus there's a really good article from the washington post uh census data shows widening diversity number of white people falls for first time okay now originally the name of the article was census data shows the number of white people in the u.s fell for the first time since 1790. i think that may have scared some people because there is a fear of a black planet i think that may have scared some people this article is from august 12 2021 they changed the title of it printed up the i printed up the article as i do many of these articles so i know what the original name of the article was this is it right here so I think that changed. Uh, I think that scared some people when they said first time since 1790. Uh, <laughs> but there's some uh, number of different reasons for this. So the first race and ethnicity breakdowns from the 2020 census released on Thursday, August 12th, show a more diverse population than ever in the nation's history. The report marks the first time the absolute number of people who identify as white also has shrunk since a census started being taken in 1790. That's when the first census was taken, 1790. The number of people identifying as non-Hispanic white and no other race dropped by 5.1 million people to 191.7 million white people, which is a decrease of 2.6%. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. 
what racism means. Racism is a power structure. Stand by. Laws and policies can't put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take it out. So you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts. You control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do a teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9:10 a.m. Superstation. 910, the Super Station, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome, welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, WFDF. Uh, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, August 15th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. All right. Um, I just sent you um, another clip, Jalen. We're going to go to that clip there from NBC News dealing with the census. Uh, we're going to go to that clip here in just a minute. OK, so right before the break, we were talking about the uh, census report that came out uh, Thursday, August 12th, the initial census numbers, Thursday, August 12th. Um, and the uh, Washington Post has a good article here. Uh, census data shows widening diversity number uh, widening diversity number of white people falls for first time first time since the first census was taken in uh 1790 and this is so the census is a re uh one of the results of the census is a reallocation of 1.5 trillion dollars in resources okay um and the census counts every person that's in the U.S., regardless of status, regardless of whether they're here legally, whether they're here uh, uh, trying to go through the process to become a citizen, whether they're undocumented, what have you. It counts everybody um, in the country. So the report marks the first time the absolute number of people who identify as white also has shrunk since the census started uh, being taken in 1790. And the census was created, we know, at the, uh, the the U.S. Constitution created the U.S. Census. The number of people identifying as non-Hispanic, white, and no other race dropped by 5.1 million people to 191.7 million, a decrease of 2.6%. Now, the country also passed two more milestones on its way to becoming a majority-minority society in the coming decades. For the first time, the portion of white people dipped below 60 percent for the first time in history the portion of white people in this country dipped below 60 percent in the 2010 census it was 63.7 percent uh white people made up 63.7 percent of the u.s population in the 2010 census the 2020 census the percentage of white people in this country dropped to 57.8 percent okay and the under 18 population is now majority people of color, majority non-white people, the under 18 population at 52.7%. Now, the new data is scaring the hell out of some people. The new data shows how the ethnic, racial, the ethnic, racial, and voting age makeup of neighborhoods shifted over the past decade based on the net uh, based on the national house to house canvas in 2020 it is the data most state legislatures and local governments uh, use to redraw political districts for the next 10 years so this data is going to be used for the next uh for the next 10 years this is why it's so critical now it indicates that the country is quote much more multiracial and much more racially and ethnically diverse than what we measured in the past said uh nicholas jones director and senior advisor of race and, eth and ethnic research and outreach at the census bureau's population uh division contributing factors to the decrease in the white population on the opioid crisis that's one of the contributing factors. The opioid epidemic and lower than anticipated birth rates among millennials after the Great Recession accelerated the white population's decline, said William Frey, F-R-E-Y, a demographer at the Brookings Institution. He said 20 years ago, if you told people this was going to be the case, 
they wouldn't have believed you. He, uh, he said regarding the white decline, he said the country is changing dramatically. The country is changing dramatically. Now, if we look quickly here at this chart, and then we're going to go to clip two, uh, Jalen, then we'll go to uh, Piper Carter, who's on the line. Um, if we look at this chart here in 1990, 1990, white people made up 75.6 percent of the U.S. population in 1990. 30 years later, 2020 census, 57.8 percent of the U.S. population. Um, African-Americans stayed basically steady at 12.1 uh, percent uh, compared to 12.2 percent of the U.S. population in the 2010 census. Our numbers increased overall by 6 percent. OK, our numbers increased overall by 6 percent. I want to go to this clip here from. Uh, this is from NBC News. This is uh, Steve Kornacki uh, breaking down the numbers here dealing with uh, the census. And he also talks about uh, how this impacts the House of Representatives and the Electoral College as well. OK, let's go to this clip. Changed in the U.S. over the last 10 years. The Census Bureau releasing its 2020 data, numbers that states will use to redistrict and potentially shake up Congress. NBC News national political correspondent Steve Kornacki is at the big board. Steve, it's awesome to see you. All right, so this data uh, could set off the most hectic, contentious redistricting cycle ever. And I know nobody gets fired up about redistricting like you do. So hit us with the big takeaways from this census data. Yeah, let's take a look here, Alice. Every 10 years, we really get these numbers and they kind of last for the next 10, we'll be staring at them for the next 10 years. Hey, it's sort of the numbers that define our country. Let me take you through the big picture. First of all, the U.S. population sits now just about 331 million. And I wanted to show you how things have been changing. Because again, we get this readout every 10 years. We get a readout of racial uh, makeup of the country like this every 10 years. So go back to two censuses ago. This is 2000, turn of the century. The country was almost 70 percent white. You could see about 12 percent Hispanic. This is what it looked like 20 years ago. Now, in the last census, 10 years ago, this is how much things changed in the first 10 years of this, of this century. The white population went down to under 64 percent, a growing Hispanic population, a growing Asian population. So the question was, in 2020, how much more would things have changed when it comes to these demographic categories? Well, the answer is, Changed a lot more than people were expecting. Take a look at this. Now, in the new census, the numbers out today, the white population in the United States, not only is it under 60 percent, it's well under 60 percent, 57.8 percent wow, white. Yeah. The Hispanic population continues to grow. That's nearly 20 percent now, getting close to 20 percent of Hispanic population. The black population is pretty level. And the Asian American population that continues to grow now basically at 6 percent. So, the diversification of America is continuing. The overall population is not growing at that fast of a rate. It's actually the second slowest 10-year period for population growth in this country ever. But the diversity within that continues to be a big story. And we can just show you, you mentioned redistricting, what it means. These are the states mm -hmm. we see in here where the population grew the most and that are gaining. These are house seats here. Texas is going to get two more house seats. They're going to have 38 house seats. They had 36 for the 10 years before this. The only state gaining more than one seat is Texas. You see Florida, North Carolina. These are the other states gaining seats. A lot of these Republican seats. So that got state. So that goes into that question of redistricting. And these are the states that are taking a hit where the population either shrank or just didn't grow that fast. They're actually going to lose clout in Congress. California, first time ever, California is going to lose a seat in the House. New York, Illinois, Pennsylvania, again, a lot of these are blue states. That's one of the factors, Allison, that goes into this when you say a redistricting, could this affect balance of the House next year? Republicans only need next year yeah. to gain five seats. And if you, if you take a look, here's the map. These are, I know there's a lot of confusing colors here. Where you see red, though, that's where Republicans get to set the rules, get to draw the maps. Where you see blue, that's where Democrats get okay. to do it. Where you see purple, that's kind of a mix, a commission, an independent commission, that kind of thing. And again, the opportunity, look, Texas, 38 seats, two new seats, Republicans draw the maps. That's an opportunity for Republicans right wow. there. Florida, that's a big one. You sure saw they're gaining. North Carolina, Georgia, those are all opportunities for Republicans. Again, they need to pick up five seats next year. Republicans get the House. Democrats, they don't have as many opportunities, but if they want to do the same thing with 
They call it gerrymandering. Democrats could do it in Illinois. Democrats could do it in New York, potentially. So there are opportunities for Democrats if they're so inclined to try to offset it there. But again, we're at a point here. Control the House is so close. How the maps are drawn in any one of these big states could make all the Okay. It's a slim margin. We could see a whole lot of change. All right, pause it right there. All right, thanks. Okay, so that's from uh, NBC News Now from uh, Thursday, August 12th, 2021. Uh, name of that clip is Census Data Release Tease Up Congressional Redistricting Battles uh, Shows U.S. Growing More Diverse. All right, that's at uh, NBCnews.com and, and also MSNBC.com. Just very quickly here, and then we'll go to Piper Carter um, from Detroit Rocks the Runway. Uh, for the 38th annual African World Festival. Um, if we look uh, quickly here, and we have this up on the big screen here, uh, California is losing a congressional seat, 52. So California has 52, uh, California currently has 53 electoral college votes associated with it, and they have 53 seats in the House of Representatives. Uh, I'm sorry, let me back up. They have 53 electoral college votes associated with them, and they have 51 seats in the House of Representatives. To determine how many seats, to determine how many electoral college votes a state has, you take the number of seats in the House of Representatives a state has, you add to that the number of U.S. senators each state has. Each state has two U.S. senators based upon the U.S. Constitution. So they're going to lose a congressional seat in California, and they'll lose uh one electoral college vote associated with california california has the most the number of electoral college votes in the country at 53 now it's going to drop to 52. new york loses one uh they drop from 27 electoral college votes um down to uh they're going to drop to uh they're going to lose one electoral college vote they they lose a uh congressional seat also um Illinois is going to lose a congressional seat. They're going to lose an electoral college vote. Pennsylvania, Michigan will lose an electoral college vote as well. Um, actually, the, the map here, this is showing congressional seats. This is showing congressional seats. OK, uh, census appointment. Um, comprising, let's see, what is this? Uh, 2020 census appointment losing seats. So this shows how many congressional seats each uh, state has. That, that are losing congressional seats. So California currently has, it'd be 53 plus two, currently has 55 electoral college votes and 53 uh, congressional seats. And they're going to lose one. Um, New, uh, and, and Michigan is currently at uh, 16 electoral college votes. Uh, Michigan has 14 congressional seats in the House of Representatives Congress. We're going to lose uh, one also, and we'll drop from 16 electoral college votes down to 15 electoral college votes. All right. So um, the you take the number of seats in the House of Representatives a state has. Vermont has uh, one. Maine has one. You add to that the number of U.S. senators a state has. And that tells you how many electoral college votes a state has. All this is based upon the census dealing with representation in the House of Representatives, and that is connected to the electoral college vote. So when you when when you try to put a when you try to put a citizenship question on the census because you want to drive down the number of responses and the number of people counted in Democratic leaning states like California. New York, Michigan, things like this. You're doing it because one of the reasons why is because you want to reduce how much, how many electoral college votes those states have, which reduces their power to choosing the next president in the presidential elections. This is why Trump wanted that uh, citizenship question on the census. There hasn't been a citizenship question on the census in the last 60, 70 years, something like that, because the census counts everybody in the u.s regardless of citizenship status okay all right um so on the line we have 
uh, Piper Carter, who is the coordinator of Detroit Walks the Runway. Now, we've had her here on the show before. She's the world-renowned world Piper Carter. Uh, she is an image maker, fashion photographer. She has been featured four times on Tyra's ba Tyra Banks' VH1 TV show, The Shot. She is the uh, first African-American woman to shoot for high-end publications such as French Vogue, uh, British Ale, New York Times, Spin, and Essence Magazine, as well as emerging talent for music companies such as Def Jam, Sony Music, Warner uh, Music, Universal Music, uh, Disturbing the Peace, Electra Records, and BET. Uh, we want to welcome back to the African History Network show, uh, Ms. Piper Carter. How are you doing today, Piper? I'm very well. Thank you, Michael and Hotep and all of the African History Network family for having me. I'm very honored that you uh, have me on the show. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, look, Detroit Rocks the Runway returns to the 38th annual African World Festival. Uh, we know the festival did not take place in uh 2020 because of uh coronavirus because of COVID 19 but the uh african world festival is returning this year everybody is excited about it and detroit rocks the runway for those that may not know is where fashion gets cultured with fashion get where fashion gets cultured and it is a metro detroit community fashion showcase that takes place inside the African World Festival, highlighting an exciting mix of African-inspired contemporary and traditional garments and live music by emerging designers and musicians of the diaspora. So tell people what day is it taking place and what time and where? So the entire festival is happening this uh, upcoming weekend, which is August the 20th right friday august 20th 22nd friday august 20th through yep. sunday and august so 20th uh, friday august 20th through sunday august 22nd yes. go ahead yep and then the fashion portion will be taking place on friday august the 20th um at 8 30 p.m and um we will we will be closing the show and right before us will be Sunshine Anderson. And she's the headliner uh, uh, music act for Friday. She starts at 7, and we're the uh, the headlining uh, cultural act, and we start at 8.30. Okay, so wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. So, you, so you've got, so you got artist Sunshine, recording artist Sunshine Anderson. I've heard it all before. You got Sunshine Anderson at the, the nobody told me this. You got Sunshine Anderson at the 30th annual African World Festival. What time is she performing? She's, uh, Sunshine Anderson is Friday, August the 20th. She starts at 7 p.m. Okay. And, and we'll be uh, following her at um, 8.30 p.m. with the fashion show. Okay, so you're in a really, really good time slot. Okay, now, which stage is this on? Let people know which stage this is on. Yeah, so we all of this will be taking place on the main stage, which uh, once you get onto the museum grounds, is directly in the back of the museum. Uh, the museum, the museum front, sits on uh, three fifteen East Warren Avenue, which mm -hmm. is basically off of John R. Between John R. and Brush. Right. And uh, the main space is right on the back of that, which um, is like the like the, you know, the lawn, if you will. The lawn. You know, you OK. See, like the so, kind of vortex. OK. So uh, it's, so yeah. it's the stage. It's the stage right behind the museum. Right. Yeah. OK. OK. That's the Ford. Uh, that's the Ford. Uh, what's the name of the, the Ford stage? Because I know they are a sponsor. Yep, they are sponsoring. So, it, but it's basically it's the Ford main stage. Ford main stage. Okay, everybody will see it, and you just follow the music. Okay, now uh, tell us what do uh, what do we have to look forward to uh, at the uh, for the Detroit Detroit Rocks the Runway at the thirty eighth annual African World Festival. I'm very excited. Um, well, first of all, I do want to say 
that, um, you know, where everyone is wearing masks. Okay. Um, and we are, uh, you know, it's outside. The entire right. the museum uh, will not be open. So there will be no indoor access to the building. Um, okay. Every, the entire festival and all the activities are taking place outside. Okay. Um, and so at the... So once, so the festival actually opened uh, Friday, August the twentieth at four p.m. Okay, that's so, opening ceremony. Uh, that's open. That's all, opening opening ceremony Friday, yep. August twentieth, uh, four p.m. Oh, August twenty four p.m. is opening ceremony. Yes. Okay. And throughout the festival, um, the vendors will be there. You know, um, you'll get a chance to interact with, you know, your favorite vendors, over 150 of them mm -hmm. that are coming down. And and um, so on Friday evening, what's really exciting is that, you know, this is an opportunity for Detroit to uh, share some of the, the best uh, fashion designers that we have, right? right? And right. for people to have an opportunity to see you know, the talent that exists, um, you know, when we talk about all of the legacy, right, in Detroit, uh, we definitely have a rich cultural history, a rich musical history. And so this is an opportunity for people to see um, some of this really, honestly, just amazing uh, talent that exists with people who are making our clothing, and especially people um who are making, uh, you know, original design, uh, quality construction, quality fabric, um, items right. and garments that you'll actually be able to wear, that you'll actually be able to purchase um, from people who are based here, who you could continue to uh, not just support, but who can uh, clothe you for, you know, your various functions or even your everyday life. Okay. Um, so that for me, that's really exciting because, uh, you know, in addition to the entertainment, you know, aspect of it, uh, you know, we definitely love the uh, self-determined aspect of it, you know, right. us, uh, you know, supporting um, economic mobility. So right. um, that okay. part for me is the, the most exciting part about it. All right. You know? So, so but, Piper, uh, so Piper, Piper, factor, Piper, Piper, slow down, yes, slow sir. down for a second. Mm -hmm. Give us some of the names of some of the designers the Detroit designers, give us some of the names of some of the designers whose uh, fashions we'll see displayed in the fashion show. Okay, so this year, uh, also too, we cut down just um, to have uh, less people, right? Okay. Um, uh, you know, backstage and, and for COVID and safety and all that, because normally we have three times the amount of models and designers on a lot, so but this year we're we um we've got five uh, strong designers. Okay. And I'll just I'll describe them pretty briefly. Okay. Yeah. Um. So Yamisi, amazing designer from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Um, she's been in the show before. She show, she sent me pictures, and I'm so excited for everyone to see what she's done this year. She's done some beautiful gowns. Um, made of um, African fabric. Um, I mean, just things you can wear when it's time to go out. Things you can wear. Actually, you could wear um, many of her uh, garments to any of your formal gatherings or if, you know, if there's a need for you to go to a wedding or if you need to go to somewhere and you really need to dress up and you want right. to look fabulous and you want to, you know, uh, wear some, and, you know, you don't want to go off the rack. She definitely uh, has you covered. Um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful so, colors. I, I'm just, I'm so really excited about what let, she's doing. Let me, um, let, let, me, also, let me ask you this yeah. quickly. Who, whose fashion is on the flyer that you sent me? Detroit Rocks the Runway flyer, uh, 30th annual, and it's uh, uh, a woman. Oh, and then, actually, it, so the flyer, yeah. So, yeah, so the flyer that I use, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't use any of the the people from from the show this year. Okay, okay. That's uh, that's a that's a uh, that's a, a, a from a different uh, 
from a different show. Okay. Because um, pe- actually, people are still making their clothes all the way up until now. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, so all right. Is like super, 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 super new. Um, there's um, uh, Sasha. And so Sasha is a is a uh, I'll say like an emerging designer. Okay. She's um, she's super young. She was in the last our last show as well. Sure. Um, that we did, and she's got she's using African fabrics as well, but her take is a bit more on the casual level. So these are things that you could kind of wear like every day. You know, if you would like to incorporate more cultural designs into your you know your sporty wear things that you could wear. You could wear some of her things probably to the office, but you could also wear, you know, some of, some of her stuff to just look cute if you want to run, you know, to the grocery store or if you want to hang out, you know, with your family. Um, I mean, they're just, you know, or, or honestly, um, some of them are just super cute if you have to go to like a cookout or, you know, sometimes you want to just uh, add some more African uh fabrics into right. your everyday, you know, wardrobe, you know, to stay up to date. Um, there, another uh, staple person I want to uh, list up is Love Rose, who is going to be featuring amazing gala and raps, traditional okay. who, who is this? and original gala and raps. Her name is Love Rose. And is that R-O-S-E? Is, actually, is that, is that R-O? Um, is that is that R O S E yep. like the flower rose? It's, it's two words. Okay. Yep. All yep. right. Two words: love and then rose. Okay. And then she um, has been with us for many years, honestly. Uh, actually, the whole time. Yeah, the whole time that I've been with uh, doing it, which was about a decade. Um, she's been uh, doing, you know, uh, rap. Um, she's rapping heads. She's rapping bodies. She's showing uh, how. She, uh, to, to do traditional and contemporary rap for men, for women. Um, and, you know, it, she gives some of the cultural history behind it. There's lots of stories that you can see in her rap um, and using, you know, various fabrics and just showing us how we can also incorporate, you know, rapping into our daily wardrobe. You know, um, part of also, what's really exciting about this fashion show in particular, uh, we're a bit different than many of the other fashion shows in that it's also um, a time for us to actually show how to incorporate our culture into into our lives, into our everyday lives. Right. You know, um, many times, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult sometimes for us to, um, you know, find ways for us to, you know, incorporate our dress. Fortunately, as we've seen, um, you know, things move on in fashion, uh, we, we have a lot more examples nowadays that, that we could see, right? You know, how we can uh, incorporate all this. But uh, but that's, a, that's a, a really important part is for us to actually, you know, really start practicing our culture a little bit more. Um, and then uh, there's two people that are really interesting as well, um, Lathias, he's doing a lot of avant-garde pieces, so he's going to be doing it. He's taking fashion, and he's going to be doing everything from kind of like your uh, your simple, uh, you know, like jacket and pants to um, something if you really, 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 you know, want to be far out there and original. Uh, and, 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 you know, if you look at your at fashion and dressing as art, then uh, Lathias is your person uh, to look to for that. And then um, last but not least, a newcomer to this uh, scene, but not to the Detroit fashion scene, is a gentleman named Seven. And his um, incredible, he does uh, beautiful jewelry and really uh, culturally inspired pieces. He makes crowns and... um, I'm, I'm just really excited because his, I don't even want to give it away, but we have, uh, I'll say his, his piece is very theatrical. Okay. And we have um, something really ex- exciting planned around um, showcasing his segment. Okay, excellent. So you have five designers. Awesome. Oh, go, go ahead. I can go, go, ahead. Go, I can go into the, 
yeah, my designers, and then I can go into the music. So, um, okay, go ahead quickly with the music. Thing that's a bit, yep, another thing that's a bit different about Detroit Rocks the Runway is basically it's live music, and and uh, and so people, all the models and the designers, everyone gets showcased walking with live musicians. And so this year, what we've done is uh, also a bit different. We have um, DJ Love Bean, if you know of uh, Tene Bismuth of House of Backstep. Okay, here in Detroit. Um, she has provided yeah. us with, here in Detroit, right. and she is DJ Love Bean. And what we're doing is an amazing, I'll call it a soundscape from the diaspora. So all the way from uh, our folks, you know, uh, African folks, African-American folks that write and create classical music to house music to techno to hip-hop to jazz and she's mixing and blending all of these sounds okay. um, for our designers to be to be walking to. And simultaneously we, she'll be accompanied by drummer percussionist Aisha Ellis and also violinist Ashley Nelson. And so there will be a beautiful, amazing diasporic soundscape to, uh, that'll be the soundtrack, right? Play right. live while the models are walking. I'm very okay. excited um, about that. All right, we're coming up on a break here. Uh, very quickly, people can visit the right.org, W R I G H T, the right.org. Uh, for, for more information on the uh, Charles H. Wright Museum of African American uh, on the uh, 30th Annual African World History, uh, African World Festival that is at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History is taking place Friday, August 20th through Sunday, August 22nd at the at the website, the right dot org. Um, when you scroll down, uh, uh, click on Explore Our Incredible Offerings. And then it comes up with information about the festival. And then uh, you scroll down, you'll see Ford Motor Company Fund. Click on download the full schedule. And they have the full schedule here uh, also that you can uh, look at. Opening ceremony uh, starts at uh, 4, is 4 p.m. And the on Friday. And the uh, Detroit Rocks the Runway starts at 8.30 uh, PM. Just uh, ho hold the line for a, a couple minutes, uh, Piper. We're going to hold you over on the break uh, for a couple more minutes, okay? Stand by, okay? All right, all right. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books. Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that'll satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand different perspectives. Empower yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. It's easy to read or listen to on the go. Blacklisted. Empower yourself. Start your free trial today. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All Black all positive all the time the largest black owned streaming television network in the world bringing our people together worldwide controlling our messages our story our way black tv the way it should be black music black history and more 30 plus channels thousands of shows black on purpose television network subscribe now the views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 9 10 a.m superstation or adele media welcome back to the african history network show right here on 9 10 a.m superstation the future radio i'm your host brother michael m hotel it is sunday august 15th 2021 and we are live. We're speaking with Piper Carter, who is the coordinator of the uh, Detroit Rocks the Runway fashion show at the 38th Annual African World Festival, uh, the 30th Annual African World Festival at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History is taking place on Friday, August 20th. Opening ceremonies at 4 p.m. Friday, August 20th through Sunday, August 22nd, um, 2021. And if you visit their website, the right.org, the right.org, W R I G H T, 
they have the information there. You can also download the schedule as well. Um, on Friday, what time does the festival end on Friday, Piper? We're back at 930 p.m. on Friday. So uh, everything is completely finished at 10 but uh, things will be starting to uh, close down around 9:30 p.m. Okay, so the, so the festival on Friday ends at 10 p.m. Uh, we see the we see the Detroit Rocks the Runway Fashion Show is scheduled 8 p.m. to 9:30 p.m. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and I'm looking at the schedule here. We're showing this on the big screen also. Uh, the schedule for the festival. People visit the right.org, W R I G H T. You can download the festival as well. And then once again, the one and only Sunshine Anderson will be performing. Now, according to the schedule, it says 6 30 to 7 30 p.m. Sunshine Anderson is performing. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, is that the correct time for her or do you know? Yes, yes. So, so, so it looks like they moved it up. Okay. So that's good. Yeah. So 6:30. Sorry, guys. 6:30 then for Sunshine Anderson. Okay. And then also too, just wanted to uh, shout out that uh, you know Saturday, mm -hmm. if, you know, come back. You can see Angelique Kijo. Yeah, Angelique you know, Kijo. Uh, the, you know, uh, right. amazing Angelique Kijo will be there. Right. Um, uh, but according to the schedule, so uh, Angelique Kijo is Saturday 7:05 p.m. to 9:05 p.m. And then what else were you saying about that's at the uh that's at the big stage. What else were you saying about uh, Saturday, uh Piper? Yeah, I was just saying that, you know, we still have all of the vendors. Yeah. Um amazing uh, cultural foods, the Watoto Village, which uh -huh. is all the activities and the performances uh dedicated to children. Right. And um just family fun so just uh you know many of the things that you have come to know as well as the other cultural performances absolutely there'll be african dance al nur african dance troupe uh there'll be libations performed at the beginning of each day it looks like you have dr B uh, uh, baba kafense chike uh performing libations he does fantastic he does a, a fantastic uh libation ceremony there'll be yoga uh, all this stuff. Now, it's all going to be outdoors. There's Afri uh, Afro-Caribbean drum performances on Saturday at Peck Park. Uh, we'll be in Peck Park also, the African World Festival. We'll have a vendor booth over in the Peck Park area uh, each day, Friday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So come see me there. and We'll have my DVD lectures and everything there as well. Uh, and I'll post information on our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com about my exact location. And I'll be uh, broadcasting videos from uh, from the African World Festival as well. Okay, so this is uh, once again this is the 30th annual African World Festival. Um, Detroit Rocks the Runway is taking place Friday, uh, August 20th, 8:30 p.m. Uh, is that 8:30 p.m. to 9:30 p.m. is the hour? It looks like. Yeah. Okay. It's yep, a, one hour. It's an hour. Uh, everything is outdoors. Everything is outside uh, this year because of, of coronavirus. Uh, you still have to wear masks. Is that correct, uh, Piper? Yes. Yes. Everyone will be wearing masks. Okay. Um, so, you know, mask all of our COVID protocols are in place. And of course, if you're not feeling well, you know, then, this, then please, you know, stay at home and take care of yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then also there'll be uh, uh, a health as wealth uh, pavilion uh, this year as well. Uh, so there's a lot of information at the website, the right dot org. Three full days of activities. Basically, all this is uh, all this is all the activities are free, basically, from my understanding. Is that correct? Most, most at least ninety nine percent of them are free. The activities. Yeah. OK. Yep. And then there are about a, yeah. a about one hundred and fifty vendors. African History uh, uh, African History Network will be one of the vendors as well. So come on out, support this. They have vendors, African vendors, African-American vendors, Caribbean vendors from uh, all over the uh, world, all over the African diaspora. All right. Piper Carter um we appreciate it oh and lastly uh i think they're still looking for i think they're still looking for volunteers for for the for the african world festival uh they have yeah. information we're looking for volunteers go ahead we're asking yep go I'm ahead saying, um just asking uh for volunteers to make sure that you have your covid test okay 
Um, and, you know, uh, just uh, like, again, with the volunteers and everyone just want to uh, make sure that, you know, if folks aren't feeling up to snuff, mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, you take care of yourself, you know, wear your mask, you know, uh, all COVID. Right. So if they, so if somebody wants to be a volunteer uh, right on the home page of the, uh, the right dot org, T-H-E-W-R-I-G-H-T, the right dot org. Uh, they have information with the uh, done with the festival and they have a, a link here. Become a uh, become a, an AWF volunteer. That's the best way. Is that the best process for people to go through to become a volunteer? Yes, definitely. Okay. Definitely, definitely. And we're just, you know, really excited that uh it's that, that we get a chance to you know be with one another you know celebrating our culture in person absolutely absolutely well i think there are gonna be a lot of weddings this time next year because uh, people are gonna meet at the african world festival i think they're gonna be <laughs> i think they're gonna be a lot of weddings also all right piper uh oh lastly on, on your bio so uh, i talked about you are an image maker you featured four times on tyra banks vh1 show the shot the first black woman to shoot for high-end publications such as french vogue British L, New York Times, Spin, Essence, Magazines. Now, were you were you a photographer? Explain that. Explain uh, explain that. The uh, first black woman yes, to shoot. I, yep, I was a photographer. Yep, yep, I was a photographer. Um, as far as the, the, the reality show, um, I had been, Tyra Banks had a show. It was called The Shot, and it featured fashion photographers. And I was one of the fashion photographers that was a uh, character, I should say, you know, on the on the reality show. Um, uh, there were different challenges, and I won those challenges multiple times. Um, and it was a very interesting opportunity to learn about television and reality shows and, you know, that, that kind of thing. As far as um, being in uh, various publications, I... Um, after finishing at the Howard University and coming home, I got an opportunity to, uh, move to New York and just fast forward. I was there, um, doing assisting and then I started, um, photographing, you know, on my own and, um, uh, was able to, uh, you know, network and have, uh, some great opportunities in, photographing for various publications and stuff. So okay. my experience is in uh, photographing fashion and model. Okay. So, so it says, this is magazine. You were the, you were the first black female photographer to shoot for essence magazine. No, not essence for uh, French Vogue and oh, okay. um, British and British L. Okay. Um, okay. Yep, yep. Actually, you, 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 um, are, you are, you are a photographer. I'm actually doing, you, doing fashion. Right. You were you were a photographer for Essence magazine, but you weren't the first black woman to be a photographer for Essence yep, magazine. I, oh, OK. I'm just looking here what it has the bio. And I'm like, wait a second. Yeah, Essence I, did not have a first black. They, they, they didn't have a black female photographer before this. OK, so. All right. All right. I just want to get that straight. OK. <laughs> so, OK. I just oh, want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah no, I, yeah. no, I photographed for uh, a lot of different, you know, publications and things, uh, music. Um, you know, entities right. and, you know, fashion labels and this kind of thing. That's my, that's my basic, um, okay. you know, uh, experience, if you will. All right. And visit her website, pipercarter.com, pipercarter.com. She's also a podcast host as well. All right, Piper, look, I'll see you this weekend. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. Shout out to Mama and Gia Kai as well, who I know is somewhere working hard 24 hours a day, <laughs> getting, <laughs> getting ready for the festival. All right, Piper, take care. Yeah, and thank you. Thanks for having me, and um, much love to the African History Network family. Thank you. All right, sister. See you guys Friday yep. uh, at the Detroit yep. Rock Show on me. All right, no problem. Take care, sister. All right. Okay, everybody, that was uh, Piper Carter, um, coordinator of the Detroit Rocks the Runway uh, fashion show at the 30th Annual African World Festival. Uh, I want to go back to the, the topic we discussed at the top of the uh, top of the hour. Call in number 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a quick question or comment. I uh, want to go back to the information dealing with the census. We're going to go to clip one. Uh, let me see. Hold on. Let me look at, uh, no, we're not going to go to clip one. 
uh, but I just want to go back to this information here and uh, we'll go, we're going to go to, uh, I think it's clip three dealing with the lynchings, uh, Jalen, we're going to go to that next. So I was talking about the article from the Washington post and there've been a number of articles written about this in different aspects uh, of the census. And we talked about this on our show uh, Thursday when uh, the information came out. Okay. So you can check out uh, our Thursday show as well. We rebroadcast these shows uh, on our Facebook fan page, the African history network, the African history network and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. But if we go back to uh, the article here from the Washington post, name of this piece is census data shows widening uh, diversity number of white people falls for first time. This is from August 12th. Um, the, and they show the chart here as well. Uh, the number, let me scroll down to this, the largest and most steady gains in, uh, uh, in the census numbers, the largest and most steady gains were among Hispanics who doubled their population share over the past three years, uh, over the past three decades, I should say, over the past three decades to 62.1 million, to 62.1 million people or 18.7% of the U.S. population in 2020 and who are believed to account for a half of the nation's growth since 2010. Now, that basically the, the growth was attributed to Hispanic Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and African Americans. That's where the growth was. We saw a decline by 5.1 million or 2.6% when it comes to the population of, uh, of uh, white people in this country. Now, Asian Americans who made up 3% of the U.S. population in 1990 also doubled their share uh, since 1990 to 6.1%, while the populations of African-Americans held steady at 12.1%. That's percentage-wise, but the number of African-Americans in this country increased by 6%, also 2020 over 2010. All right, so you'll hear more about this uh, as well. And go back and check out our show from uh, last uh, from last Thursday, August twelfth, where we dealt with uh, some of these numbers. Also, okay, I, I want to go to this next story here that deals with a a um, big article, big report from the Washington Post from August eighth by Denine L. Brown, and this deals with uh, lynchings, modern day lynchings in America. OK, and uh, this deals with lynchings. It talks about lynchings in Mississippi. Uh, lynchings in Mississippi never stopped. Lynchings in Mississippi never stopped. It was a big article from uh, the Washington Post. We, we discussed this earlier in the week. Uh, Saturday, August 14th, on the uh, cross connection with Tiffany Cross, MSNBC, she interviewed uh, Deneen L. Brown to uh discuss this article but just very quickly here uh we'll go to that clip in just a minute it's very quickly um they talk about uh, in the article denine l brown uh talked about jill colin jefferson and jill colin jefferson is an attorney and the founder of a uh organization called julian named after civil rights um activist and civil rights legend julian bond and she, uh, she has been researching lynchings in this country especially in mississippi she said the last recorded lynching in the united states was in 1981 but the thing is lynchings never stopped in the united states lynchings never stopped in the united states lynchings in mississippi never stopped okay uh, the evil people just stopped taking photographs and passing them around like baseball cards. Now, Jill Colin Jefferson was born in Jones County, Mississippi, which was an epicenter for uh, epicenter of the Ku Klux Klan's reign of terror uh, during the civil rights movement. Coming from uh, Mississippi and seeing uh, stuff intersect, 
talking about this stuff is like talking about what happened down the road, said Jill Collin Jefferson, who is a Harvard Law School graduate who trained as a civil justice investigator with Julian Bond. Uh, in 2017, Jill Collin Jefferson be began compiling records of African Americans found hanging or mutilated across the country. In 2019, she began focusing her investigation on Mississippi. In 20, so she began compiling records about African Americans found hanging or mutilated across the across the united states in 2017 and 2019 she began focusing her investigation on mississippi in each case she investigated law enforcement officials ruled the deaths suicides but the family said the victims had been lynched the, the and she talked about how the uh, authorities were quick to rule the deaths as suicides but the family said the victims have been lynched. Now, historically, lynchings were often defined as fatal, as fatal hangings by mobs or lynch mobs, white mob, white people, Europeans, often acting with impunity, impunity and in an extrajudicial capacity to create racial terror. Crowds of white people often gathered in town squares or on courthouse lawns to watch African-Americans, especially African-American males being lynched. Ida B. Wells did a lot of research on this after the People's Grocery Store murders in Memphis, Tennessee in 1892. Ida B. Wells, the great uh, journalist and anti-lynching activist, civil rights activist, and she found out that a lot of the lynchings were uh, because of consensual sex between white women and African-American men. Now, from 1877 to 1950, more than 4,000 African-American men, women, and children were lynched in cities and towns across the country, according to the Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson, the Equal Justice Initiative, a human rights organization based in Montgomery, Alabama, which opened the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in 2018 to honor thousands of lynching victims. During that period, Mississippi recorded 581 lynchings, the highest number of lynchings recorded by state. Uh, NAACP.org, their national website, they have information dealing with lynchings there. And uh, they talk about how from 1882 to uh, 1968, there were 4,743 uh, lynchings in this country. 72% were of uh, African-Americans, but also um, you had 1,297 white people who were lynched uh, as well in this country during that period of time because the Ku Klux Klan and other domestic terrorist organizations, uh, they weren't just targeting African-Americans, but they were also targeting white Republicans as well and allies of African-Americans. Uh, we'll continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Policy that put us in this predicament is going to be law of policy that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do what people would go to know. We have it all on 9 10 a.m. Superstation. 9 10, the Superstation, the oldest radio station in town since 1922. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, August 15th, 2021, and we are live. Uh, call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number uh, if you have a question or comment. All right. Uh, right before the break, uh, we were talking about a bigger article from the Washington Post from um, August 8th. This is from uh, Sunday, August 8th, 2021 by Deneen L. Brown uh, for the Washington Post. Okay, we're going to go to that clip from MSNBC here in just a second, Jalen. Um, name of this article is lynchings in Mississippi never stopped. Lynchings in Mississippi never stopped. And this deals with, uh, it talks about modern day lynchings. And she spoke with Jill Collin Jefferson, 
who uh, is the founder of a civil rights organization called Julian. And Jill Collin Jefferson has been tracking uh, lynchings in this country. She started compiling uh, information about lynchings in this country in 2017. And in 2019, she began focusing her investigation on lynchings in Mississippi. And she said there have been eight lynchings in Mississippi since the year 2000, but they have all been ruled suicides. Now, when we deal with the history of lynchings, we know that uh, from 1877 to 1950, more than 4,000 African-American men, women, and children were lynched. Mississippi had the most number of lynchings at 581. And at NAACP's uh, uh, national website, NAACP.org, they have a section there. If you just search for history of lynching uh, in America or just search for lynchings, they have a section there uh, that deals with the history of lynchings. And they talk about how from um, uh, the, they have a section, how many people were lynched from 1882 to 1968, 4,743 people, 4,743 4, lynchings occurred in the U.S. according to records maintained by the NAACP. Other accounts, including Equal Justice Initiative's ext extensive report on lynching, count slightly different numbers. Uh, they also deal with how there were 1,297 white people lynched in this country as well. African-Americans made up 72 percent of those who were lynched at 3,446. But also what's not talked about is how there were immigrants that were lynched as well in this country. Immigrants from Mexico, China, Australia and others also were the targets of white domestic terrorism, even though African-Americans got the brunt of the uh, attacks. And that's also a legacy of slavery as well. Now, so read the information they have here at uh, NAACP.org dealing with history of lynching in America. We know it was back in 1917. We talked about this on this show recently, back in 1917, uh, where you had the silent march uh, up and down Manhattan, Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, where you had 10,000 African Americans uh, who were uh, protesting lynchings and they were demanding anti-lynching, uh, a, a federal anti-lynching law. Okay. And we're still uh, trying to get a federal anti-lynching law passed. We know that it was the idiotic uh, conspiracy theory spreading uh, Senator from Kentucky, Rand Paul, who blocked the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill in the U S Senate in 2020 that, uh, then Senator Kamala Harris and Senator Cory Booker were trying to get passed. Uh, but, you know, he'll have Rand Paul will have glowing things to say about Dr. King. Uh, read this article here from blackpass.org, New York City in uh, NAACP silent protest 1917. And it shows uh, them marching. Here's 10,000 African-Americans uh, protesting anti uh, protesting the lynchings. And that was precipitated. One of the things that caused this march was the East St. Louis, Illinois race ride in 1917, uh, where you had, had a number of African-Americans killed there. And we know this march here was organized by James Weldon Johnson of the NAACP. And James Weldon Johnson is the man who wrote the lyrics to lift every what, what became known as the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. He wrote that in 1899. OK, I, I want to go to this clip here. This is from um, this is from uh, MSNBC, uh, Tiffany Cross. Uh, her show, The Cross Connection, she spoke with uh, Deneen L. Brown, who wrote this article for The Washington Post called uh, Lynchings in Mississippi Never Stop. Let's go to this clip, Jalen. All right, from 1877 to 1950, a period of less than 100 years, lynch mobs of white people seeking to uphold racial segregation through racial terror murdered more than 4,000 black Americans across the South. That's according to the Equal Justice Initiative. Now, the state with the most lynching was Mississippi. And while the last official recorded lynching in the U.S. was 40 years ago, the Washington Post reported this week, according to court records and police reports, that since 2000, there have been at least 
eight suspected lynchings of black men and teenagers in Mississippi. Joining me now is the magnificent reporter who wrote that piece, Deneen Brown from the Washington Post. Thanks so much, Deneen, for being here. I, uh, you know, you wrote this story and it went viral. Um, I think a lot of people were very surprised that this kind of thing still happened. And I think a lot of black people, um, it brought up a lot of generational trauma for our community and what we've experienced. So let me just dig right into it because there are people who might say, well, how do we know these aren't suicides? Is there any reason to believe that any of these were suicides? Yeah, so uh, as you said, since 2000, at least eight black people, uh, black men and teenagers were found hanging in trees in Mississippi. Joe Collins Jefferson, who's a civil rights attorney who's been investigating these, these cases, says that there's a pattern here. So she says that often police arrive at the scene of these hangings. Um, the, the hangings are immediately as, a, as suicides. The things are not preserved. Um, the uh, the, the uh, investigations, um, according to families, are not thorough, and the cases are often never heard again unless somebody brings them up. Um, so, but families in each of these cases have raised legitimate questions about what happened to their loved ones. So, for example, in the Willie Jones, who was found in 2016, he was found hanging from a pecan tree in the yard of his uh, white girlfriend's house in Mississippi. Just minutes before he was found hanging, there was an argument with the stepfather of right. his girlfriend who had threatened him. And he was found with um, a belt around his neck that did not belong to him. And also his family said that his right arm was disabled. He couldn't lift his right arm above his head, so it was impossible that he could have hung himself, according to right. his family. Yeah, and uh, some, of, some of the other things that you point out, you're reporting, there was grass found in his hair, grass found in his wallet. How would that have gotten there? Um, there was clearly an argument and dispute. Some of the timelines don't add up. Uh, you know, these are all things very familiar. Now, I do want to point out um, that you did uh, reach out to the DOJ uh, about this, and I do want to uh, at least read their response um, when asked by a reporter whether the uh, DOJ or FBI was investigating the death of Jones and at least seven other black men found hanging in Mississippi. Uh, a spokesperson responded, we were aware of all the matters and review them all, we have no further comments. So not a lot of information. I mean, I think in your reporting, I saw there was a lot of stonewalling. Um, you know, I, I think this is something that's so interesting as well, because there was this case that you revisit in your reporting where 10 white teenagers, um, you know, essentially beat a man to death as they ran over him with his car. And I think why this is so poignant is because when you look at pictures of lynchings, this was a family affair. I mean, white women brought their children. There, there were families there having lemonade and watching somebody get mutilated and burned to death. So the fact that these children who witnessed this are still alive in Mississippi, it does, it's a head scratcher. Yeah, in that case, uh, that was the case in 2011 of Craig Anderson, who was fatally beaten and attacked by white teenagers who were hunting for black people. They said that they were actually hunting for black people. Uh, the federal judge in that case during one of the sentencing hearings said that this case evoked Mississippi's very disturbing disturbing legacy of lynching. Um, so yes, yeah, there is, uh, the state is very haunted by its past of uh, uh, or uh, racial terror lynching. And as you said in your opening, Mississippi had the most lynchings in, in New York's history. So it's disturbing for many of the black families when they find uh, a black men and black teenagers hanging from trees, they immediately think lynching. And the fact that the, the police uh, officer uh, or the police force on scene uh, with the case that. Okay, hold on just a second. We lost uh, the connection here. Stand by. Yeah, yeah, man, I dropped uh, the call from Skype. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, okay, yeah, the, the Skype dropped the call. It, back, back it up like about 30 seconds or a minute or so, man. Let's go back to the clip. All right, thanks. His name was Nick Taylor. He was 23. He was found in 2003 with his own 
the case that you write about. They made this assessment within 45 minutes. Um, something equally disturbing, uh, Cindy Hyde Smith, she's a senator um, from Mississippi. Uh, she made a, a lynching joke when she was running for Senate um, and still was able to, to win her seat, which was, was quite um uh, disturbing. One of the men that you write about, he was found hanged with a dog chain as a noose. That doesn't seem like something that someone would use to hang themselves with, even though the psychology is harming yourself, but that seems very strange to me. Right. The family in that case uh, say that there are a lot of unanswered questions. Families are raising legitimate questions. Yes, his name was Nick Taylor. He was 23. He was found in 2003 with his own dog chain wrapped around his neck. So yeah, it raises a lot of questions. There were yeah. other cases that I listed. Roy Beale, for example, had a pillow case over his head. He was found in 2004. He'd recently returned uh, uh, to Mississippi to fight for his family's land. Otis Bird was found with a bed sheet wrapped around his neck. Um, Philip Carroll, who was 22, he was found in 2017. Um, the neighbor who showed police where the body was Remember that his hands had been tied, but later uh, they said that there was no evidence that his hands had been tied. So there are a lot of questions that families say are unanswered in these cases, and they're really seeking um, answers. Yeah. And this, I mean, look, if eight white women were found hanging from trees, it would be breaking news across all three uh, networks, I think. So thank you so much, Deneen, for bringing very important information uh, to the forefront. I know that you had a personal experience while you were down there investigating the story. You were followed by a pickup truck, um, which is very interesting in Mississippi. So we'll have to have you back on to talk about that as you continue to explore this story. Thanks for joining us. Okay. That's um, Tiffany Cross, the Cross Connection, speaking with Deneen L. Brown of the Washington Post who wrote this extensive article uh, that came out August 8th, 2021. Lynchings in Mississippi never stopped. Lynchings in Mississippi never stopped. Uh, okay, let's go quickly here to the phone lines. Let's go to uh, April line. Okay, we lost April. Uh, call back April. Let's go to Dave, line two. Dave, welcome to the African History Network show. Uh, thanks for holding. Tell us where you're calling from. Thanks for Dave from Norfolk. How you doing, Mike? Hey, how you doing? Norfolk, uh, uh, Virginia. Dave? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, All right. Sir. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, about the, um, the lynchings, of course, they never stopped. They've been they've all sorts of killed. I think if they dredged the rivers in, in, uh, in, um, in uh, Mississippi, you find a whole lot of bodies that were thrown in there after other killings. Right. But of course, they never stop. But I'm actually calling about the census. Okay. You know, a lot of us think that because there's going to be a majority minority, uh, what, in 2050? By, by, by 2045. Yeah, by, 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 by 2045. More, by 2045. Yeah, more yeah. political or more, more, more power for us. But it could wind up being uh, uh, more like South Africa, which is my biggest fear that we don't. If we don't get organized and we don't start embracing a certain solidarity and unity, we can wind up being kind of picked apart and uh, compartmentalized to the point where even our numbers won't be effective anymore. What do you think about that? Right. Yeah. Well, that's why we have to organize. That's why we have to uh, 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 reclaim our history and culture. And that's why we have to organize and understand politics and laws and policies and how all this intersects. This is why and, and, and this is why we're under attack right now in the state legislatures with Republicans trying to pass these voter restriction bills based upon the big lie. OK, because they see they, they, they see the handwriting on the wall. This is why Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump were pushing through many of those unqualified uh, young white conservative uh, federal judges because they saw the handwriting on the wall and Republicans want to control uh, the federal bench, the U.S. Supreme Court and the state legislatures. OK, they want to they want to control all that because those those federal uh, judgeships, those are lifetime appointments. OK, those judges, the 200 and about 225 judges that Trump got confirmed, they can be on the federal bench for the next 35, 40 years ruling on cases. OK, so they see their handwriting on the wall. So we, we have to understand how all this is connected. OK. All right, Dave. All right. Thanks for calling, man. Keep listening. All right. 
Thank you. Uh, no problem. Let's go to uh, Marathon Line 3. And Marathon, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Uh, tell us where you're calling from, Marathon. Calling from Tune Production, LLC in Detroit. Okay, from Detroit. 9, 10 uh, a.m. Okay. Yeah, I'm really enjoying the show. It's very enlightening. And uh, I had heard an uh, article saying that for the first time, the numbers of whites is, is dwindling. The U.S. Census, the, the, the 2020 the Census report, yeah, the 2020 Census report that came out Thursday, August 12th, shows that for the first time since the census yeah. was taken in 1790, yeah. the overall number uh -huh. of white people dropped. It dropped by 5.1 million. For the first time, the, the overall number of white people dropped. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, you know, uh, I'm not surprised about the lynching. I didn't know it was to this extent, though. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah that's from uh, the year 2000 to the year 2019 uh, that they're tracking that those uh, uh, lynchings took place. Okay. All right, all right. Thanks, yeah, Marathon. I'm listening. Okay. On the show. Okay, keep listening, brother. Thanks for calling. Oh, bye-bye. Okay. Uh, I want to go to this. Uh, let's go to this next story here. Um, Haiti has been hit by a 7.2 uh, earthquake. And if we look at the updates here from uh, the watch, from the New York Times, so it's approximately – um, it's over 1,200 people who are reported dead from this devastating earthquake. Uh, the 7.2 earthquake was, was a devastating blow to a country still reeling from a presidential assassination. Uh, Jovenel Moise was uh, assassinated early, uh, it was July 7th, uh, 2021. A, a tropical depression is expected to batter the island starting Monday. Um, so we're looking at the live updates here from the Washington Post. Nearly 1,300 uh, people are reported dead. Uh, Haitians struggle with a lack of basic supplies, including food and medical care, in the aftermath of a magnitude 7.2 earthquake that happened on Saturday, August 14th, that snapped water lines, blocked roads, flattened grocery stores, and damaged hospitals on the country's southwestern peninsula. The powerful earthquake was a devastating blow to a country that is still reeling from a presidential assassination in July 2021 and that never recovered and that never recovered from a disastrous earthquake more than 11 years ago. Aid groups and government rescue workers established a single uh, operations center in Port-au-Prince to uh, coordinate the earthquake uh, earthquake response, but many in the hard hit town of Les Cayes, uh, Cayes uh, were loading injured, it, the injured into cars and onto private planes and uh, to try to evacuate them from the capital Port-au-Prince for care. Um, now a former Senator uh, for Haiti, Herve uh, Fakand was using his small propeller plane to ferry people to Haiti's capital. He said, I have 30 people in serious condition waiting for me, uh, but I only have seven seats. All right, now, uh, to complicate the chaotic efforts even more, Tropical Depression Grace was expected to pass over Haiti on Monday or Tuesday, bringing heavy rain and possible mudslides. The confirmed death toll rose on Sunday to 1,297, uh, Haiti's Civil Protection Agency said on Twitter. Okay, uh, I want to go to that clip, uh, dealing with Haiti from uh, MSNBC. Um, uh, Jalen, I think I sent you that clip. Uh, this gives an update on uh, the response effort and the devastation of the earthquake in uh, Haiti. Let's go to this clip. The news, we're now gonna to go to Haiti, where devastation from the massive 7.2 earthquake is mounting there. Search and rescue teams combined with bystanders are searching through the rubble to find missing people. The death toll now has risen to more than 700. 
dead and 2,800 injured, according to officials. And today, the country was hit by a 5.8 magnitude aftershock, aftershock rather. And if you're counting, that is the 15th so far. You're watching a brand new video taken by a drone of the destruction. Homes, hospitals, schools, and churches all damaged or destroyed. And as if it could not get any worse, a tropical storm is on its way as well. And the impacts could be felt there as early as tomorrow. Let's bring in Carol Buck, the acting country director of Mercy Corps, a humanitarian organization, and Bianca Ocasio from the Miami Herald. First to you, Cara. Your team has been on the ground in Haiti. What are they seeing? How are they preparing for this tropical storm? Because if you're trying to recover folks, when that dirt and gets wet, it gets heavy and difficult to move. Absolutely, and thanks, thanks so much for having me. So, you know, it's been a really long 30 hours for those of us in, in Haiti. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, a number of aftershocks. Um, we are, you know, fortunately hearing that the uh, tropical storm may hit further north, so not at the epicenter of the earthquake. But, you know, currently um, I was just, uh, you know, I, I spoke with my teammate in, in Nice, um, and he told me, you know, everywhere is agony. People, you know, on the streets, um, buildings collapsed, roads uh, blocked, bridges collapsed, and, and local markets as well. So people really struggling to get what they need um, at this very difficult time. It's a perfect storm in many ways, uh, Bianca, because Haiti, as you know, has been dealing with political instability. We're hearing this area is hard to get to by roadways in the south. So the good thing is that it's not as populated but it's hard to get to. There's also the issue of gang violence that impedes the ability to get workers there. What do we understand in terms of the rescue workers, the first responders, how many are getting there? How many more do they need? So right now what we know is that uh, the U.S. did deploy a 65-person uh, search and rescue team to assist with uh, the efforts of finding people through the rubble. And as we know, you know, first 24 hours after the disaster are, are very critical. Um, the New York Times did report that there has been some... Once upon uh, a time, then... The, ...the roads into the southwestern part of, of the country, which is really uh, the hardest hit part uh, due to the to the earthquake and also the aftershocks that have been fairly significant. So, you know, it's still not clear exactly the extent of the damage. Uh, we do know that there have been total, complete hotels that have collapsed, uh, cathedrals, churches, homes. Uh, so, you know, it, it is going to be uh, a long rescue process and, and mission for, for Haitian authorities. Okay. Pause right there. That's from uh, MSNBC. Uh, that's from uh, Sunday, August 15th. Um, give an update on Haiti. And we know that it's over uh, over 1,200 people uh, who are reported dead uh, because of the earthquake. Uh, NBC News has an article here. You can check out more than 1,200 dead in earthquake as Haiti braces for tropical storm. All right. And that's from Sunday, August 15th. Um, TheGrio.com has a piece here dealing with tennis uh, uh, star Naomi Osaka. Uh, Naomi Osaka pledges uh, tennis tournament earnings to Haiti earthquake relief. Osaka is set to compete in the Western and Southern Open Tennis Tournament in Cincinnati on Monday, uh, August 16th. Naomi Osaka announced that proceeds received from a tennis tournament she is scheduled to compete in this week will be given to uh, relief efforts in Haiti following an earthquake that devastated the nation on uh, Saturday. Uh, Naomi Osaka made the announcement on tw on a Twitter posting. Uh, the four-time Grand Slam winner uh, wrote about the hardship uh, that have befallen the Caribbean country. She said, uh, quote, really hurts to see all the devastation that's going on in Haiti, and I feel like we're re we really can't catch a break, she wrote. Uh, Naomi Osaka is half Haitian, but uh, by way of her father. She said, I'm about to play a tournament this week and I'll give all the prize money to relief efforts in Haiti. I know our ancestors' blood is strong, will keep rising. Uh, check out this piece here from thegrio.com. Naomi Osaka pledges tennis tournament earnings 
to Haiti uh, earthquake relief. Now, also, there's a piece from uh, NewsOne.com uh, about Wyclef John. Wyclef asked people to help Haiti after another, after another earthquake, after another, after another earthquake. Let's pull up this clip here. Uh, pull this article here from uh, NewsOne.com. Uh, Wyclef asked people to uh, help Haiti after another earthquake. Here's how to do your part. Uh, this is from NewsOne.com. You can check this out as well. And um, there was a, we'll talk some more about this on uh, Monday show. Okay. But check out this piece here from uh, NewsOne.com as well. All right. Uh, I want to go to this other story here quickly. Uh, we're going to go to the clip from uh, uh, Dr. King and the filibuster. Um, uh, Jalen, we'll go to that in just a second. Uh, Shikari Richardson is uh, back in the news. And we know that Shikari was, um, people were looking forward to seeing her race in the Olympics, uh, run uh, in the uh, track and field, uh, 100 meters in the Olympics but she was banned due to uh, failing her drug test. But there's going to be a showdown between uh, Shakai Richardson and the three Jamaican team winners who won the, um, who, who, uh, who won the 100 meter race, who won medals in the 100 meter race in the Olympics. Okay. Um, team Jamaica's Elaine Thompson Hera, Shelly Ann Frazier Price, as well as uh, Sharika Jackson, are all competing in the uh, Prefontaine uh, Classic that's uh, coming up in Eugene, Oregon. There's a piece here from uh, thegrio.com uh, that talks about this, and also one from hellobeautiful.com. Uh, Shakari Richardson to race against six Olympic finalists following disqualification this is the piece from uh the griot.com hello beautiful um has has won as well so uh, things are finally looking up for track superstar shakari richardson after being this uh, suspended from team usa over a positive marijuana test uh heading into 2020 olympics the athlete now has a second chance and is able to redeem herself at the upcoming prefontaine uh classic in eugene oregon in Eugene, Oregon, where she will, will she'll race against all three 100 meter Olympics medalists, Team Jamaica's Elaine Thompson Hera, Shelly Ann Frazier Price, and Sharika Jackson. Now, Tom, uh, so uh, the three Jamaican runners, uh, Thompson Hera, Frazier Price, and Jackson, each won gold, silver, and bronze in the final race of the, in the final 100 meter race at the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, the same race that Richardson was set to compete in before being disqualified. Now, uh, Richardson will have to work, uh, will have a work cut out for her in this upcoming race as it, it, as it was Team Jamaica's Thompson Hera who broke the 10.62 second record, a record previously held by the late Florence Griffith Joyner. Joiner Flojo, Thompson Hera's new record of 10.61 uh, seconds earned her the gold last month. The, the uh, with teammates Fraser Price coming in second place with 10.74 second, seconds, and uh, Jackson finishing third with 10.76 seconds. Okay, uh, I want to go to this clip here. This is uh, Dr. King back in July 5th, 1963 talking about the uh, filibuster okay this was a um interview that was uh done by journalists with uh, dr martin luther king jr let's go to this clip mr workman do i understand you doctor to mean that you would have then brotherhood by federal force to those people who are not willing to engage in what you would consider to be brotherhood no, I, I don't mean you would have brotherhood by federal force. I don't think you can really have uh, true brotherhood by federal force. 
I do think, though, that you can break down the legal and the external and the man-made barriers that make brotherhood impossible by federal force. In other words, I don't think you can have brotherhood as long as there is a system of racial segregation. And I do feel that this system can be broken down by federal force. Now, when you move to the realm of true brotherhood, a true integration, which is genuine intergroup, interpersonal living, mutual acceptance, then we move into another realm altogether. And I don't think this can be done by a federal force, but I think that these barriers can be broken down and it can bring us nearer to the goal. If the president's program were incorporated or such portions of it that would lend themselves to this, how would you feel about submitting this to a vote of the people of the United States who have never really had an opportunity to express themselves in this area? Well, this would certainly be all right with me because I think the vast majority of people in the United States would vote favorably for such a bill. I think the tragedy is that uh, we have a Congress uh, with the Senate that has a minority of misguided senators who will use the filibuster to keep the majority of people from even voting. They won't let the majority of senators vote. And certainly they wouldn't want the majority of people to vote because they know they do not represent the majority of the American people. In fact, they represent in their own states a very small minority. Senator Eastman in Mississippi represents a very uh, uh, small minority. Oh, okay, pause, pause it right there, Jalen. Pause it right there. Okay, uh, those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P, keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting for a few more minutes, and we'll finish the rest of that segment in that clip. That is from Press Conference USA. That's from July 5th, 1963. Uh, that's courtesy uh, C-SPAN and Real America. Uh, that is uh, so you can Google that. Uh, that's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, uh, press conference. And in that press conference, he talked about the filibuster. OK, if you'd like to stop of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal. PayPal dot me forward slash the AHN show. And at our website, African History Network dot com. Uh, we're here six days a week to help us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Uh, be sure to register for the 10 week online course I teach on uh, Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, uh, 1865 to 1968. That's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well. And I'll see you at the uh, 30th Annual African World Festival, Friday, August 20th through Sunday, August 22nd. We'll be in the Peck Park area. We'll have a vendor booth there. Come see me. We'll post more information at our website and give you updates throughout the week as well. Right now, let's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. We'll count it forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. Okay. Um, you can register for the 10 week online course. As soon as you register, you can watch the class we just did this. Uh, this past Saturday, and we'll post a link here. Uh, courses regularly $130 is on sale $80 from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, I want to go back to this clip here with Dr. King. Uh, so there's a commercial that's airing now, a political commercial, uh, encouraging people to uh, contact uh, Joe Biden to um, man that he ends the filibuster okay in the senate now joe biden can't end the filibuster in the senate because he's not in the senate anymore he doesn't have a vote now he can put pressure on uh kristen cinema of arizona and joe manchin of of west virginia etc but biden cannot end the filibuster okay only u.s senators who vote in the senate can end the filibuster but it's still a good commercial and they have a uh, excerpt of Dr. King from uh, this interview, July 5th, this interview, uh, this press conference, July 5th, uh, 1963, where Dr. King is talking about the filibuster here. Okay. I want to go back to this clip. Just a second. Let me cue this up here. I want to finish the rest of, uh, 
want to finish the rest of uh, this clip here so you can hear his response. All right, everybody stand by. Okay, let me go back to this here. Okay, just a second, let me. For the United States, we have never really had an opportunity to express themselves in this area. Well, this would certainly be all right with me because I think the vast majority of people in the United States would vote favorably for such a bill. I think the tragedy is that uh, we have a Congress uh, with a Senate that has a minority of misguided senators who will use the filibuster to keep the majority of people from even voting. They won't let the majority of senators vote. And certainly they wouldn't want the majority of people to vote because they know they do not represent the majority of the American people. In fact, they represent in their own states a very small minority. Senator Eastland of Mississippi represents a very uh, uh, small minority of the number of people who live in that state. And I think this is true all across the South. Well, is not this part of the American system? And then you would, in effect, change the system so that there would be dictation from the executive office rather than legislation under our present system of representation? Well, this is a system, but it is not democratically applied in so many southern states. Uh, let us take the state of Mississippi as an example. Uh, you have about 20,000 Negroes registered to vote in the state of Mississippi. Uh, now, many of these people are not registered because all types of conniving methods are still being used to keep Negroes from becoming registered voters. And in fact, some are even killed for seeking to lead voter registration drives so that the democratic process is not operative in situations like Mississippi and Alabama and so many of the other states, southern states, where there is this determined effort to keep Negroes from becoming registered voters. Well, let me say this, that if my name is Kayla Smith Owens, college student, majoring in criminal justice. Hold on just a second. Let me back this up. Uh, now, many of these people are not registered because all types of conniving methods are still being used to keep Negroes from becoming registered voters. And in fact, some are even killed for seeking to lead voter registration drives so that the democratic process is not operative in situations like Mississippi and Alabama and so many of the other states, southern states, where there is this determined effort to keep Negroes from becoming registered voters. Well, let me say this, that if the right to vote, which is a basic civil right, is prescribed both by the Constitution and by statute. I think there can be no one to impede that. But I'm confused over what you turn to be basic constitutional rights, which would give the federal government authority to direct one's private business. Under what section of the Constitution would you say that could be done? Well, I think it could be done under several sections, but I would like to see it under the 14th Amendment, which says that no state uh, has a right uh, to deny an individual equal protection of the law. And every state has a responsibility, it has the authority to give these businesses licenses to operate. And the fact that this is done by the state means that these businesses at that moment forfeit the right to deal with uh, individuals uh, any way they please. They must be under the scrutiny and under the direction of federal authority on the basis of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Well, an extension of that then would mean that all of us who are licensed to drive automobiles would come within state scrutiny for whatever purpose they wish to do. The state's hand extends everywhere, you see. Oh, yes, it, it, it extends everywhere where basic human constitutional rights are involved. And I am absolutely convinced that there's something wrong with a nation that would put property rights over human rights. And I think states should have rights, but no state should have the right to do wrong. And this is why we have a 14th Amendment to regulate 
uh, these wrongs that are often committed in the name of states' rights. Mr. Ennenfall. Dr. King, um, the impressions that one seemed to have um, from the initial hearings on the pr uh, president's proposed civil rights uh, measure seemed to be that uh, there, will, there will be an uphill fight uh, to get the bill through. Um, should either there be a filibuster or for that matter, if when it comes to the vote, uh, the bill is defeated, what sort of um, action um, do you uh, propose I mean, to fight uh, for the attainment of um, equality? And for that matter, do you anticipate um, working much more closely with the other separate Negro movements? I think uh, there will be, I'm sure, filibuster, and we will definitely protest this. We will lobby in Washington seeking to get congressmen, uh, senators to stand up in a very firm, forthright manner with a determination to see this bill through. We plan to have a march on Washington on the 28th of August, at which time we will take a stand, letting the nation and the world know that we are determined to see civil rights legislation. Uh, beyond this, we will have to wait it out and see what happens. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt, Dr. King, but our time has expired. Thank you for being with us on Press Conference USA. All right, so that was from July 5th, 1963, Press Conference USA. Uh, Dr. King was uh, interviewed. It's about uh, almost 30 minutes, okay? I Googled that and found that. So you hear a clip in, in, in that interview, uh, that press conference that is in the um, political commercial calling on Joe Biden and asking people to contact Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, and asking to end the filibuster. But Biden cannot end the filibuster because the filibuster is only in the U.S. Senate. Only U.S. senators have a vote to end the filibuster. Now, he can put pressure on Senator Joe Manchin and Krista Sinema and a few other Democrats who don't want to end the filibuster. Or, well, first of all, they ain't going to end the filibuster. They can alter it. Uh, Biden has supported moving uh, moving to a standing filibuster back to what it was decades ago. Uh, they can do a carve out uh, to get the voting rights uh, the, for the People Act passed, et cetera. They're not going to end the filibuster. That's not going to happen. But this is for good historical purposes. And Dr. King is talking about how the filibuster uh, has been used historically um, to block civil rights uh, legislation, block civil rights bills. OK. All right. Now. Um, very quickly here, the piece I was talking about on uh, Shakai Richardson, I want to pull up that article from. Uh, I want to pull up that article from um, HelloBeautiful.com. I, I, I showed you the one from TheGrio.com. Uh, Hello Beautiful has one as well. And I think a lot of people are going to be watching uh, this showdown between Shakai Richardson and the uh, medalist from the 100-meter uh, competition in the uh, Olympics that just took place. Uh, this article here from uh, the Grio, uh, Shakai Richardson said to race all three Olympic 100 meter uh, medalists after Team USA suspension. This is from the Grio.com. And they have this uh, post here on Instagram as well. This great post of uh, the Prefontaine Classic, August 20th, 2020 through August 22nd. Uh, August 21st. OK, the Prefontaine Classic. This is going on at the same time as the uh, African World Festival. So I'm going to have to I'm going to have to record it, figure out where it's going to be, because uh, I definitely want to uh, see that. And we have a graphic of this as well. We'll pull up because I downloaded this also in preparation for this segment. OK, wrong graphic. Uh, that's done with hip hop's birthday. This one right here. That's what I want. This one right here. Okay. So I think a lot of people are going to be watching this. Uh, people are rooting for, uh, Shakari Richardson. Uh, this is taking place August 20th through August 21st, the Prefontaine classic in Eugene, Oregon. Okay. Uh, if we go back to this piece here from the, 
hellobeautiful.com. Um, and Shikari Richardson is focused on running a good race since she last competed at the U.S. Olympic trials. Uh, Shikari's agent, Ronaldo Nehemiah, told the Wall Street Journal she will be focused on executing her race. She will be focused on executing uh, her race to be the best of her ability, regardless of who is in the race. Now, America fell in love with 21 year old Shikari Richardson after she burst into stardom with hopes at the Olympic uh, fold when she won the women's 100 meter race at the U.S. Olympic track and field trials in Eugene, Oregon, back in June of 2021. Uh, it was her colorful wigs, tattoo, tattoos and piercings and long, long nails that um, attracted people to her and fierce attitude that had uh, fans rooting for uh, Shakari Richardson. We saw the interview she did on the Today Show as well. Uh, we know her um, qualifying meet, but back in June of 2021, her qualifying race, we know that went viral. I saw that not only on uh, Facebook, but I also saw it on Instagram as well and Twitter. So uh, we know that went viral also. Okay. So many people are complaining, comparing her to uh, the great Flojo, Florence Griffith Joyner. Uh, yet all of her hopes were shot down when she lost her spot on Team USA after testing positive for THC following the trials. We went through on this show, unlike a lot of other places, we actually went through what the guidelines were regarding THC, regarding cannabis from the uh, U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. We went through that and showed why she was disqualified. Go back and watch those broadcasts. I went through extensively through that and showed you the policy at their website. And then also people compared her to Michael Phelps. Uh, Michael Phelps, uh, his suspension was three times as long as Shakari Richardson. He got three months. She got one month. Uh, a picture of him smoking uh, marijuana from a bong surfaced after the 2008 uh, Olympics where he competed in. Um, he never tested positive for uh, marijuana. So his case is totally different than this here. Go back and watch those broadcasts. We went through that step by step and dispelled all these myths. Now, now we'll have a second chance to uh, cheer on Shakari Richardson uh, from afar as she takes on Team Jamaica in the upcoming race let's go shikari hello beautiful.com says you know now <laughs> you know i'm rooting for everybody black <laughs> those, those 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 sisters on the jamaican team those sisters on the jamaican team are nothing to be played with yes i want shikari to yes i want shikari to win but i'm rooting for everybody black okay that's that's, that's just me all right but um she is going to be racing against uh uh, Elaine Thompson uh, Hera, Shelly Ann Frazier Price, and uh, Sharika Jackson. Okay. And uh, we know these ladies took uh, uh, gold, uh, silver, and bronze in um, the 100 meter um, competition at the Olympics. And here is uh, Elaine uh, Hera uh, running. I think this is, uh, who is this? Yeah, Elaine uh, Thompson Hera of. Um, jamaica all right and i think we have some uh, other pictures of the jamaican team uh also yeah jamaican track team here as well so i think a lot of people are going to watch this you'll probably see this on social media uh as well you'll probably see pictures on social media uh videos of this and captions and it'll probably be on TikTok, etc now, hopefully, Shakari will pick up more endorsements. We know she's in the um, uh, Beats by Dre um, uh, commercial for headphones, but you know she should be in more commercials also. Hopefully, she'll win gold here, and she'll get more endorsement deals uh, as well. All right, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Uh, be sure to register for the 10 week online course I teach on Saturdays from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. 
uh, it's at, at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, uh, and as soon as you register, you can watch the class we just did this past weekend. It's a 10 week uh, online course uh, that I teach each class. We go through and analyze about a 10 year period of time, uh, starting in 1865 when the Civil War ends. Uh, and then also the other class that I teach, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. 